The Sporland Division of Parker Hannifin Corporation is sponsoring this podcast. Sporland is the leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components. Using quality materials and craftsmanship, Sporland maintains a commitment to innovation, manufacturing excellence, service, and support for its customers since 1934. The company is known for its catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemicals, smart service tools, ZoomLock Max Press to Connect, and ZoomLock Push, Push to Connect Refrigerant Fittings. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. This episode is sponsored by United Refrigeration and Westermeyer Industries, revolutionizing your HVACR experience. Visit URI.com for all your HVACR needs, offering real-time inventory, personalized pricing, and a nearby stock feature. Access quick pick replacement parts and branch details effortlessly. With 350 plus fully stocked locations across North America, our knowledgeable staff are ready to assist with the solutions you need. Exclusive offer, use code ARPOD on URI.com to get a $10 gift card when purchasing the Westermeyer oil float, part number W4300-38F. These high performance floats are not just compatible with their own oil separators, but also available as a crossover model conveniently stocked at United Refrigeration. That's code A-R-P-O-D to claim your $10 gift card. Visit URI.com now. Everybody. Welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. Here with us, Brett Wetzel, and Kevin Compass is currently on vacation, so I called in a favor to a gentleman that I've known for a while. He's been doing refrigeration since we used to be able to vent before, and now we can vent again. This is Mr. <laughs> Paul Bennett from Hill Phoenix. How you doing, sir? Good, Brett. How you doing? Thanks for having me on, brother. Oh, I'm exhausted. It's been an exhausting couple weeks. I went to, I went to, so two weeks ago, I was on vacation. I drove from Dallas to Oklahoma City, to Oklahoma City, to Tulsa, to Branson, Missouri, to Branson, Missouri, out to Arkansas, and then came back on Saturday night, drove out to Houston on Sunday, taught for a week, then came back Friday, and then home Saturday, and then Sunday, flew out to LA, so right now I'm at the training center out here in uh, Fulton, California, and Time change really messed me up, man. I, I got up at first day, Monday morning, I got up at 2.30. I usually get up at 4.30 in the morning. That made sense. Why? And I was like, oh, I need to go back to bed. And then I went back to bed and then I woke up in a panic at around 3.30. And I was like, I, like you're one of those times where you think you oversleep and you're like, what's going on? What time is it? I'm like, oh, shit, 3.30. All right. Looks like I'm uh, just staying up from here. So after that, I had a meeting with my team at the corporate office and got back around eight o'clock. So I'm just running on fumes right now, running on fumes. So I'm in the same boat you were. I left, I flew from California Monday morning, but unfortunately I had, I didn't go to bed till I get what you call channel fever and can't go to sleep because you're afraid to not wake up. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I didn't get to sleep till one o'clock, woke up at 2.30, went to, drove an hour to the airport, got on a plane. Flew out here, arrived at 11, and didn't get to sleep until... I did go to sleep last night for an hour and a half, and then I got that call from you, and that woke me up again, and we got back up and talked. <laughs> well, it, was, it was funny, because I didn't realize... I knew you said you were going to California. I didn't realize you are literally just a half an hour away from me. Yep, half an hour away. We're going so, to a store the other side of Ontario tomorrow to do on-site 3D Touchy Touchy. Yeah. I was out teaching. But yeah, I got up at... I was the same with you. I was up at 3.30 and talking to one of the other field service guys doing a startup at ShopRite in New Jersey. So I was helping him correct E3 problem, program problems and get his rack started this morning before I even went to work. Yeah, offline, I got to ask you about some of those problems because I, I had a, a problem and 
I don't know. You and I can talk about it right after here. But uh, hey, uh, if anyone doesn't know uh, know you, Paul, a uh, little bit about yourself and how long you've been in the industry and what you're currently doing now. So I, right out of high school at 18 years old, joined the Navy, went into the military. I did a stint from 78, I'm showing my age, to 88. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to say that's old, but I was six. <laughs> But go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> My son is 39, going on 40 this year. So I worked on 1,200 pound steam turbine plants, 945 degree steam. Mm -hmm. So 1,200 pound CO2 plant is no big deal to me. There you go. You got the light back on? No, I'm just gonna go. I have enough light from the other monitors. So the office I'm in is basically, it has a motion sensor which is really infuriating. I'm going to have to figure something out because I'm going to have someone working out of this office here shortly. And it's, I've just been sitting here probably what, 10 minutes with you. And I was like, yeah, the light's probably going to go off again. So I can just sit here and nope, nope, I'm done. All right. I'm not getting up. Go ahead. Sorry. You better do that because the screen's reflecting back into your glasses and it looks oh. like you got a pair of them 3D glasses on. <laughs> I'm off. I'm done. <laughs> anyway, I, was... I joined the Navy, got out in 88. I went to work for an HVAC contractor, uh, did that for a year and a half and got a job with Kramer Refrigeration out of Kramer Trenton, New Jersey. Oh, okay. And worked for them for two years before they filed Chapter 11, closed up the doors, and then Russell Coyle, Arco Coal Zone out of uh, Chicago bottom. Ended up Is in that, Arizona. Did they have the thermal bank at that point? Yes, they had the thermal bank. Yeah. When, yeah, uh, yeah. when Russell bought it, we took it out to Yuma. I ended up going out there setting up the, the plant line to build the equipment. Because when they bought it, they thought they were going to get a, bit of, a bunch of instructions on tab A goes into slot B, and that's not how it was. So literally, I went out and set up a production line with no experience. Oh, shit. Yeah. And from there, I went, I've, I've done marine refrigeration. I've done, I worked out here in California for three years at Market Refrigeration Specialist, MRS. Gotcha. For Bill, I can't remember Bill's last name now. I understand he's finally passed away. Mm -hmm. Moved back to North Carolina, went and worked for a contractor, started my own business for a while, and then ended up working for Hill Phoenix in August of 2016. Did my first CO2 startup in February of 17, and mm -hmm. haven't looked back since. Damn. Gone on 400 plus. And so because you... Okay. So because you did marine uh, refrigeration, did you do any CO2 when you were doing the marine stuff? No, we didn't have any. Back then, it was when I was doing marine work, it was still 12, 22, and 502. Okay. All to right. give you an idea, back when I started, 12 was 25 cents a pound. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> it was cheaper to fill up a leaking system and just come back a month later, put some more in, than to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that anymore, do we? we don't do that anymore not allowed to do that anymore but we can vent co2 that we can until someone figures out a way to to recover it yeah, yeah. that's so, correct so we'll see what happens so i i did field service work as a regional service tech doing a couple states and within a year i was doing the whole northeast with helping the uh, other fscs and then uh, about a year and a half two years ago they asked me if i wanted to position as a field service tech CO2 specialist. So strictly all I do now is CO2 and deal with the racks alone. Cool. When are you going to get a nice cushy job, Eric Berman? Uh, just... Eric Berman retired. Yeah. He retired now? He retired Friday. Damn. We lost Rusty. He's in a better place now. He didn't die, but he went to work for North say, You can't say it like that. We lost Rusty. <laughs> Rusty's my buddy, man. I talk more to Rusty now. Then when he worked for us. I got you. I talked to him the other week. I was supposed to go up there, up in Pittsburgh, and then I had, we had some scheduling issues. And it was either I hobnob up in Pittsburgh for a little bit, or I'd teach the guys down in, in Houston. So I was like, I'll go down to Houston. So I had to call and cancel. I'm going to, I think I'm, I'm definitely going to Irwindale. And I, and if all else goes well, I think they actually might be having another NASRC out in Seattle, I think, maybe, possibly. They're looking for other places to do it. There's even talk with Rusty and the NARSAC about trying to get one down in North Carolina. What they do, I, you know, enough, that's they, them. they just got to find a big enough place to put it on. I, I know it's usually three, you know, upwards of almost 400 people that are at those places. So, oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you what, Brent, 
that 449 uh, Union Hall where they train. I saw. That was got to be one of the most impressive training facilities I've ever seen. And that equipment, was... when those kids take those classes, when they walk out of there, they start walk out with a tool bag and a meter when they're done. And the really cool thing they do that they were talking to us about was the vets don't pick anything. Get the hell out. Yep. I know with the military, they have some kind of program where they can get into something where they do potentially get paid to train them because we're doing something similar here where I work. And I'll talk about more about that later. But, but yeah, we want to try to get people into the industry because no one really wants to do this work anymore. And you can make a wonderful career out of it. Just people don't really do it anymore. But um, we drilled it into their head for how many years? Go to college, get a degree, become a white collar worker. You don't need to go to the tech schools. Yeah. yeah. So, and now we're in trouble. So that's why we're trying trouble. to build the industry up. All right. I'm going to bring up your presentation and uh, you take it from there. I'm sure I'm going to have a bunch of questions. So let's go from there. All right. Very good. All right. So this is basically an introduction to our CO2 rack. We're going to discuss the, the booster flex overview. We're going to discuss piping and the instrumentation diagrams that we use to assemble the racks, major components and functions, having a little pressure. Is that pressure switches? Can you read that? Pressure safety. It's so small. It's really hard for me to read yeah. it. On, put it in, put it in presentation mode. All right. Then, yeah, I'll lose you, but that's okay. That's all right. I'll still be able to see you. Yeah. All right. And then cold, our cold weather package for areas like North Can like Canada, Northern North America, our auxiliary condensing unit for power failures, warranties, and any other questions we have over that. Our customers really starting to do a lot more with the auxiliary condensers because that seems to be something that should be done that we're really not doing that we end up losing a whole bunch of charge because of that. I know there was some talk also about potentially making the standard where it was everything was like 90 bar. Yeah, the on the first note, the they're starting people are starting to realize that little bit of extra money spent for the the, the heat exchanger, the vessel, the pressure switch to run these on a small uh, heat generator. I apologize is worth the money because I got, I was asked a couple of years ago by one of our engineers, Scott Martin, the difference between he's been hearing there's more leaks on CO2 systems than there are on regular systems. And my, the response there is. Is, <laughs> my response to that is a leak. I don't care if it's on CO2, 448, 404, 22, a leak yeah. is a leak. If you got a leak, you got a problem. Now we do have events. All right. Event is you lose power, you have a failure, an oil failure, you lose your medium temp compressors, and then you blow a relief valve on the vessel because that's usually the one that's going to go. Yeah, for sure. Yep. But those events, everybody thinks as soon as you lose power, that vessel within 20 minutes, that vessel's popping. I've been out there 95 degrees with the guys changing, changing out the separators and them take an hour and a half to do it. And we're still well under the 45 bar relief valve, let alone the 60 bar. The class that I'm teaching, like I that basically turn the class into almost like a startup class. So we start off with a rack that has just 10 pounds of pressure in it. And we just do a potential, just a startup throughout the whole thing. And long story short, one of the things like some service tricks as well is like when they have to work on it a long time, I told them, I was like, hell, if you know, just drop the flash tank pressure and just have this medium temp suction, just pull off that and get it at a lower temperature. And then it gives you a little bit more of a buffer, right? If you're in a real hot spot, Texas or whatever, it'll give you a little bit more longevity as far as the amount of time that you can have that system potentially down for. That's exactly right. There's a couple of ways to do that. Just like you said, if you're sitting there watching it, something happens, you break a bolt on the separator and you got to replace it and you go way too long over, besides the fact that all your cases are warming up, your vessel pressure is going to climb. And if you get close to 800 pounds, just take one of the take on the, the manifold for our uh, pressure gauges and trans transducers. Just open up the vent, and let it piss off. You're going to cool the vessel right down. As soon 100%. as you start taking that pressure out, that's the nice thing. We it was on the test today, and I said it like 30 times. CO2 is a volatile, violent refrigerant. When anything happens with it, it happens quick. So we, you're good. We, we had a gentleman in, in class, he, he turned off, I told him the procedure for restart. And I told him, I was like, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta make sure they disable the enable after you're done pumping it down, after you empty out everything and then re-enable it after 
you you don't have the cases still enabled because at that point the expansion valves are going to be at 100 percent and then you're just sending all that liquid all the way down the line and then it could potentially go off on relief and or uh, pressure so i saw the relief and i'm looking at the gauge i'm like it's rising he didn't listen and all of a sudden psh, he's what happened i was like what didn't you do <laughs> but that's that's the whole purpose of the class right if you're gonna mess it up rather when there's no food at loss right exactly yep learning class and hopefully you're a kind of person that you learn one time because if you learn two times we might have to have a conversation <laughs> i'm sorry paul go ahead man <laughs> all right so this is one of our auxiliary units this is a rack up in uh walmart canada if i'm not mistaken Okay. You got the the silver box on the left is where your heat exchanger, your expansion valve for your Freon side is, or, or your 448 side is, what's connected to the, I think I want to say that's probably a heat craft exchange condensing in it. So that can it. run off a small generator. We've actually sold racks and bought and sold a Generac generator, a 5KW generator, mounted it on the end of the skid. And then they would pipe in the condensing in it and the lines to, to the flash tank heat exchanger and then hook up a pressure switch and control it that way. So I have a question. If you have a if you have a transcritical booster, your low temp relief is typically at 435 or whatever. What do you, what are you putting that relief down to? Are you knocking it all the way down below 400? Or what? Do, go ahead. The heat exchanger? Yeah, yeah, with uh, the pressure switch that's, mechan that's mechanically on there, right? Yeah, we're actually only monitoring the vessel pressure. So our alarm on an iPro is 575, and our safety cutout, where we actually close down the high pressure valve is 610. Mm -hmm. Some 620, depends on who programs it. Mm -hmm. So what I, how I like to program it is I'll set that pressure switch for around 600, because I don't want to hit the safety. So you're really just trying to conserve the refrigerant in the vessel. You, if the if the relief pops for the low temp suction, eh, whatever. But at least we're conserving most of the refrigerant in the in the vessel. Is that the thought? That's the thought. And okay. If we're in, if we're utilizing this auxiliary cooling unit, the ECU, we're probably in some sort of rack fail. And if we're in rack fail, all our cases should already be shut off. Yeah, and and I, I, have, a, I have a question about your guys' stance because I've seen some customers utilize MOP. And some customers not utilize MOP, you know, and they also have the MOP program differently. So my thought is like, if you have open cases and you have an MOP alarm because your rack has went down, if you don't have an auxiliary condenser, you want to stop all the fans and all the lights from actually being on. Because if you keep rolling heat across, across the evaporator, you're just adding more load to that, potentially popping your release off quicker. Is that an app? That, that's, that's a good, that's a good explanation of it. Hell, this is how I say that the MOP is there. So say you're running along at 200 PSI on your low temp suction, 400 PSI on your medium temp suction. You lose a compression, a compressor. Where that MOP actually really helps us is we're still running along, but our compressor can only handle so much of the suction pressure. Mm -hmm. So on the low temp rack or low temp cases, we set that MOP at 312. Mm -hmm. So if we get to 312 on the low temp suction, we're going to be putting a pretty good load on that scroll if mm -hmm. it's a flex 2O rack. So we're going to start cutting them cases off. It's not going to kill the lights or anything. It's going to kill the valves. That's going to give the compressor a chance to bring the suction down. Then the valves will restart. Yes, it's going to be banging back and forth, but it's going to keep the system cooling until somebody can get on site. And no, and I understand. I'm sorry. And I understand that, but I just meant like on total failure, especially with cases that don't have any doors, right? Low temp, uh -huh. you can kind of keep that load. You got the ice cream there and conserving that. So whether, whether that's going to be an issue or not with that, but I meant more with medium temp, right? Because the medium temp, like it or not, as well as I do, you are letting a little bit of warm air in there, especially if you don't have the difference in temperature, right? If you, especially if you don't have the difference in temperature, because that's basically what's making your barrier. So if you do not turn off the fans, then you're essentially just bringing in whatever ambient air, let's just say 75 degrees. So you're going to arbitrarily raise your suction a little bit quicker is what yep. you typically would if they, you wouldn't shut off the fans. Go that's ahead. agreed. And see, that MOP really comes into effect if, say, you lo lo lost Modbus communication between the uh, E2 and the controllers, and you had a rack fail, then uh, you, you're not, there's no signal to kill those valves or kill those controllers and turn them off. So that MOP comes into play. When, when, once we reach that MOP, it shuts them valves down. Okay. But unfortunately, the MOP that we use won't shut the lights and all fans off. 
it just kills the pulse valve. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I know Dan Foss, they have, they do have that capability of doing so. I, I haven't looked at the other case controllers like the CC 200s or whatever, but I guess you could use that kill that MOP. If you can maybe derive that into the emergency shutdown function. Yep. I'm sure it could be programmed that way. They're pretty smart these days. I yeah. leave that to all the intelligent people. <laughs> 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 but anyway, yeah, we can utilize this. Most stores will have some vendors or stores will have an auxiliary condenser for backup. If they lose all the power to the store, they're going to at least keep their computers running. And it doesn't take a lot to run that auxiliary condensing in. So you can tie it into that little auxiliary condenser. Oh my God, I keep hitting it. I don't know how to go back. <laughs> Give me one second, Brent. Yep, no problem. Oh, no, we're good. Now we're back in the control. Cool. All right. So this is one of our old, this is an old flex one rack. I can tell because the E2 is mounted to the control cabinet with the electrical. Yeah. On our new flex 2.0 design, one of the things I asked for was to separate the EMS package from the electrical package. And it works out for the factory because if you're building a rack, you have a standard electrical package. And then you can have a separate cabinet next to it. And I think I've got a slides later on that show this. And mm -hmm. then you can just put a Dan Foss package, a Corel, an Emerson, or a microthermo package on it. Just makes it easier for assembly. Gotcha. But yep, this is that's the auxiliary condensing unit. It's an option. It's an option I would recommend, especially if it's a known area. Like we, the one we did put in was Indiana, Pennsylvania. They were known for having a lot of power outages. All right, let's go on here. So this rack, people call it a transcritical rack, but it's not a transcritical rack. It's capable of transcritical operation. This is a booster rack all day. It's a booster rack when it's subcritical. It's a booster when it's supercritical, right? Would you agree? 100%. Very good. I know a lot of guys will refer to that as a transcritical rack. It's, it, what it means is we have the capabilities of transitioning from subcritical to supercritical. Unless you're in Texas or Arizona. Now it's always a transcritical rack, That's right? correct. <laughs> but in Texas and Arizona, well, I don't know so much about Texas, but in Arizona, boy, that adiabatic can really give us a lot of benefits. Can it yeah. Well, they, like I said, you are right about Texas because you could be in a place like Houston where it's as humid as a locker room. And oh, you can yeah. also be a little bit north Texas where it's a little bit drier. Still got some humidity, not horrible, not, not Florida. I spent a little bit of time down in Houston when I was out in California, when I was working for marine refrigeration, we were down there changing most of the floating oil rigs had shell and tube condensers. They would pump that water all the way up from the water line, all the way up to the uh, base of the rack or the oil, the oil rig. Mm -hmm. And we were in there changing them out to copper plated condensers for the air really? conditioning and the refrigeration. So we were getting lifted up every day in a basket going up almost 10 stories. <laughs> you can keep that. Yeah. All right. So basically our booster rack is we're taking our low temp discharge, dumping it into our medium temp suction, and then boosting that on up to our condensing pressure. Then we come back off the condenser through our high pressure control valve and into our vessel. We'll go into these later on in a little bit more depth. Sorry, I keep hitting that damn thing for some reason. You got the remote now. I don't understand why. Well, I got it sitting here. I'm tapping and talking. I got a lot of pent up energy. All I did today was stand around and talk. <laughs> You're doing I some more. Like <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then back into our flash valve and either down through our liquid to feed our evaporators or up into our medium temp suction for excess gas in the pressure in the vessel. Back to why we are not doing 90 bar uh, systems right now. The um, U.S. market still doesn't have a 90 bar evaporator. Right now, the pressure ratings on most of our evaporators we're utilizing on the low side of these racks is rated for 650 to 700 PSI, agreed? Yeah. So, but I, but hold on, hold on. Is, it, is that because they're using thinner copper? Because yes. like, I saw my first adiabatic I was at, I, I can't really say that the person or the manufacturer, but I was there and I was like, is that copper on the adiabatic 
gas cooler? And they said, yes. I'm like, but high pressures are like three eighths pipe. I'm like, oh, okay, burst rate. Okay, all right, fair enough. The, the, the size of the pipe is also the determination of the burst pressure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So anyway, though, what we do, what the American manufacturing does is build a lot of little relief valves in the return bends. So in case you do build up too much pressure. You got what I said, right? Yep. <laughs> For those who don't know, when we start, we put too much pressure in those evaporators and we're going to start popping the re return bends. That's our secondary backup. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then you got your gas cooler bypass, which basically takes SX pressure from the vessel, depending on the manufacturer, what they run it at. Our European brethren, they run it at a 38 bar vessel, which is a good pressure but it's too close to our 45 bar relief valve that we have to run on that because of our case capacities. Yeah. The uh, first pressure on our coils. And then we run at 515. So that's basically somewhere around 35.5 bar. Gotcha. All um, right. And, and I know you're, I know you're talking about your relief, but you have to make sure when just because you have that relief doesn't mean you can just swing that relief. You have to actually pay attention to the PNID diagram. I'm sure Paul's going to go through that. Yep. But there are certain parts of the piping where if you were to uh, basically shut that down, that might go from XHP to K or L copper. And, and usually it's like right before the filter dryers. I don't know how it is on the advancers, but on some of the other manufacturers, they stop right there. So just because you have that swing relief, you have to make sure you see what piping is there to see what the rating is of that when you are trying to utilize that, that actual, that high, that what they call the service relief, correct? Yes. And I'll tell you a little story. We had a contractor down in your neck of the neighborhood who piped Texas? up uh, one of those W stores mm -hmm. and he piped the entire store, including the, uh, everything from the rack to the condenser in K copper. Right. We, uh, luckily right. the FSE was very vigilant and happened to catch that before they turned the rack on. Someone would have had a bad time. There would have been a bad day. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, we've had, we've gotten a condenser from BAC. When we have a condenser from the Vlada back in the day, 2017, 2018, that they shipped us the wrong fin patch. So we got standard coils in our high pressure adiabatic condensers. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. They reached to about 900 before they start popping them relief valves. <laughs> the little ones on the end. <laughs> so, like, when I teach classes, like I tell the guys, every everything from discharge of the 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 high end compressors out to the out to HPV is typically always either stainless or XHP, yeah, and then sure. anything else, assume that it's K copper. And and they're like, I see here on L. I said, assume that it's supposed to be K, and then follow the P and ID diagram because it will tell you what copper is supposed to be in there. Yes. So copper is rated for a pressure. But that pressure is rated at a temperature. So say it's well, just per se three three eighths or five eighths line. It's rated for seven hundred psi at two hundred fifty degrees. So mm -hmm. if we start raising that copper above that two hundred fifty degrees, we're gonna that we're gonna degrade the rating on that pressure, right? I think we go across that if we get that far in there. All right, let's go on and see what we got up next. Useful definitions. Subcritical. Subcritical means we're below. The, that round circle critical point on the dome, we're working down in the subcritical region below 87.7 degrees ambient. And that means we're going to be a standard condenser with a receiver on our rack. When we transition above that into the supercritical region is when we become a flash tank and a desuperheater. So, Brent, I got a question for you. Got one. When we go transcritical, supercritical, if we do we need a condenser? De superheater, really? What are we doing there? We're basically taking hot gas and de superheating it a few degrees, right? That's it. And then putting it right back in the high pressure valve where we flash it back to a liquid. Yes. We're manipulating the refrigerant to basically get it to do what we want it to do. Exactly. We want to stay on, we want to stay there. When you follow this thermal line up and we get into super critical, there's a dome line that we want to stay on the left side of that keeps us wet. We want to drop out about 80% of our vapor to a liquid. 
then that only gives us 20% of that back as a vapor, which we have to consume. And that also affects our energy efficiency. That's when we become inefficient, really, is when we're putting that vapor back and have to consume it. Yeah, because if we can't technically condense it through the condenser, gas cooler, then basically there's a lot more waste. Yep, that's correct. So what's in this green line is basically the low temp compression. I apologize. The, the, the medium temp is on the top there at 400 and the low temp is on the bottom there at 200. And basically that's our heat of rejection on the top and our heat absorption through our evaporator on the bottom. So when we go through the evaporator, we're going to absorb our heat flashing off our liquid to a hopefully mostly vapor and bring it back through the compressor. And then the low temp compressor pushes it up to our medium temp suction. Then our medium temp suction takes it up and pushes it up to our condensing pressure. Hence, it's a booster system. The critical point is the top of the dome where we transition from a two-phase vapor liquid to a single-phase plasma-like dense gas. Correct? Yeah, I was, I was told that it could basically be anything in any of this area. It could be crystally, it could be vapor, it could be plasma, like it could be basically it's the Schrodinger's cat of refrigeration at that point. Yeah. Yes, we have no idea what it's doing. Even if we open up the box. <laughs> yes, even if we open up the box. Dan Foss's DTR charts are pretty good. They were back there when the Danish Institute developed the CO2 rack, and they've been there the whole time. So they've got one of the best PTR charts on where we stand when we're up there. I use so, their, their sliding ruler for when I'm diagnosing a system. So let me just stop a misconception because sometimes people, I, I hear people say, we stop running transcritical when we're below 87.8 degrees outside. No, because like you have, to, that's 87.8 degrees saturated condensing mm -hmm. temperature technically, right? Yep. So that means that if you have an adiabatic and you're able to get, have a five degree TD on there, that means maybe if it's 82 degrees, we might be just the scotch under the sub or the super or the super critical point, the critical point. So yes. it isn't, it, we're not running, we're not definitely running a transcritical when we're in the 80s. But if we're about 82 ish, we're right underneath it. But at 87 degrees, we're definitely 87 degrees ambient. We are definitely running at the above the critical point. That's correct. That is correct. All right. So once we hit the 87.8 or 10, 1070, 170, everybody's got a different little number in there. I'm not worried about a degree. CO2 cannot exist as a liquid. The highest pressure and temperature where the refrigerant can still condense is our critical point. Transcritical is when we transition above that critical point and we're going from a two-phase refrigerant into a single-phase fluid. And then we get up into the supercritical range and we're now transcritical. So basically our condenser has turned into a gas core, i.e. the superheater, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pressures will, de will depend on what our ambient temperatures are. I've got a rack we've been monitoring for a couple of years at Michigan and one in Fargo. The one in Fargo this year, they hit 99 degrees. That rack was running at 1,360 PSI. The high pressure valve was at 60%. Is there a problem? If that high pressure valve hasn't hit 100%, that valve and rack is still doing what it's supposed to do. And yeah. when, when, when one of our engineers researching the design, Neil Hayes plotted it out, it was almost dead on where it needed to be according to Dan Foss's tables. Chances are the adiabatic was just a little bit dirty. That's why I was a little bit off, right? Yeah. The, the gas, well, gas coolers and condensers, they lose efficiency every year, whether people like to admit it or not, right? Yeah, they do, because what happens? They get dirty, stuff collects on them, the fins degrade. If you live close to the ocean, what's the life cycle of a condenser? For seven years, five to seven years, you usually start to see them fins flaking off. Yeah. Depending yeah. On, on what condenser manufacturer it is, too. Because there's a lot of them out there to use polyester coated fins. We used to do that with, when I worked at Russell. But yeah. the, the issue is when they shave, when they cut the fins, they leave that, excuse me, that raw edge. So that raw yeah. edge is where everything's going to start happening. 
Not just that. I've also seen the the bronze coat that used to be on there for a lot of the a lot of the, the salt water areas. Like when you order stuff for like big places like SeaWorld and stuff, they'll put the bronze coat on. Yes, but sir. but the problem is if a young apprentice doesn't know not to use the really nasty coil cleaner on there, you might have a little bit of an issue. Yeah. I'll tell you in the Virginia area around the uh, Chesapeake Bay water drain, yeah. you're not allowed to use any chemicals. You can only use Dove or Dawn and pres pressurized water, and you have to recapture that water and, and uh, collect it. Yeah, I'm aware that I had. A, I worked at a place where they would actually periodically the EPA guy would come up and check the drain. Like the, he'd pull water out of the drain to see to make sure no one was throwing anything they weren't supposed to in the actual, in the drain water. Yep. All right, let's go on. I think I feel like I'm repeating here. All right, so anybody working with CO2 needs to know the two things, the transcritic, the critical point and the triple point. Our triple point is 61 PSI. At 61 PSI and below, we will change state into what I still refer to as a violent volatile refrigerant will flash into a solid. We will actually do sublimation where we change states from one to the other without skipping. It's really hard to do though. Like you, I mean, I, like I know a lot of people are like, oh, you're going to make dry ice. It is fairly like you have to have a buttload of liquid in there and flash it off yeah. really quickly in order to do that. I've tried a bunch of times. About the only place I've seen it is when we pop a relief valve that, and it's liquid in there, that discharge gas going out there, you'll, you'll get a snowstorm. Yes. Yes. That's and then it. I have been doing this since 2017 and I haven't dry iced the rack yet. And I've worked on, I've started 400 plus racks. Yeah. I, we have a little chamber on our rack that we can dry ice, but like I said, it's difficult to do. Because, yes, yes. you know what I mean? But it's still need to be aware of it because God forbid if you ever tried to it, then the little relief valves on the side of the coils might become really big relief valves on the side of the coil. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. There's a nice video, everybody. You can Google Dan Foss triple point video and you can actually watch that happen. That's a really good video. It's an old video. It looks like an old World War II movie, but yeah. All right. Sublimation is the transition of any substance directly from a solid to a gas phase without passing through the intermittent liquid phase. Like I like to give an example of that is your grandmother's closet where she used to throw mothballs in there for keeping the moths out. Eating in the old days when they made clothes out of wool, they go directly from a solid to a vapor. And then our changing of states is called eblimation where we go from solid to a liquid, to a gas, and then back in the same order. All right. Today's episode is sponsored by the RefRush Shield RDP Series Differential Pressure Monitors from Westermeyer Industries, now available for transcritical CO2 systems in addition to other common pressures and refrigerants. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Wait too long to replace and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. But replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The RDP series differential pressure monitors, including the new transcritical CO2 model, are available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerin.com. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N-T-C-O-M. A myth. I was asked a question a couple of years ago about, well, you got CO2 running at 12, 1300 PSI. So suppose we get a pinpoint leak and it's coming out at a, as a pure line, would it cut your limbs off? And I laughed. I said, that was a myth we lived with in the Navy with 1200 pound steam plants, but no, it's not. Pressure's a pressure. You drive a forklift, right, Brett? Yes. What are you sitting on? How much pressure are you sitting on that seat that's in them lines just below you? I was gonna guess around 3,500. 5,000 PSI. And that's down there with with your buddies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's your PIND diagrams. I just got that. <laughs> <laughs> I was slow to get that. I'm like, who are my buddies? Are you talking about? Oh, I got it's you. Down with the, with the kids. Oh, All no, right. No, so no. on a, the, our PNIDs for our racks that we use to assemble them, this is a booster rack. 
you have three low temp, medium temp on this rack here. This is a three by two. So that means we got three medium temp, two low temp compressors. Before I start this slide, so say you have a low temp rack. You, we have actually run a minus five rack using rack utilizing only medium temp compressors. Mm -hmm. But to go below that minus five, you have to have low temp compressors. Mm -hmm. Do you need medium temp compressors for that same rack? Yes, you do, because it's a booster rack. If you push from low temp up to condensing pressure, your your God, I can't even think of the word today. And I use it, your compression yeah. ratio goes through the roof. Hey, so, Dorn has a pretty cool compressor out right now. Can do it, man. Yeah, I, I saw it. But they had a good, they had a good, they had a good teardown class at up there at 449 in Pittsburgh. Keep, keep rubbing it in. That's fine. Keep rubbing it. <laughs> we even got shirts, Brent. You would have got a shirt and got to sign the wall. All right, enough, enough. Go ahead. My pride is hurt. All right, very good. All right, let's go on here. We have in the circle our three medium temp compressors. Yeah. All right. Then we have two low temp scrolls. This would more than likely be one of our flex ones or flex two racks, depending on the design. And this should be our flex two. We have our oil separator, our coalescent oil separator. On our racks, it's going to be either a Temprite or a Westermeyer. Both have their pluses and negatives. We have heat reclaim. So if you look at this heat reclaim, at the very top, you'll see a line just above about 10 o'clock where our discharge comes in. We bullhead into that line, go up, and then that first top line is our heat reclaim. Then we turn down, go to our Bolimo three-way valve, turn 90 degrees, that's our condenser inlet. And then the very bottom line is our heat reclaim return. With our normal operations, we're coming in, hitting the bull head, going down, turning 90 degrees, going to our condenser. When we go into heat reclaim, we go, we, this, this Bolimo valve will close off to the condenser and open up to the heat reclaim return on the bottom, allowing gas to flow through our heat reclaim on the top. Now, we operate that off a loop sequencer trying to maintain a minimum 16-pound differential. And where that would come in to play is not so much in the summertime when you're dehumidifying, but when that rack is running in the winter, you could actually have a lower pressure in the condenser than when it starts going through that warmer air in the heat in the heat reclaim, right? Yeah. And once again, you always have to make sure, because if you are running this straight to a separate coil, make sure that coil is also rated for the TC side of the the high pressure side, whatever you want to call it, the transcritical side of the booster system to make sure that it can handle that pressure if you are putting those in. That's correct. And they should all be rated for 2000 PSI. And you guys never fully pump those out, right? So that's one thing that kind of weirds people out. How comes they don't run a pump out line on there? And I said, probably because if, God forbid, if you would do the whole pump out sequence, you would have had to make sure that the PID is real super slow on there because you're basically, if you would pump it out and pump it out into the flash tank and then just open that up, now you're going from 490 pounds or whatever, all the way up, or whatever you keep your flash tank at least said 515, 515. and go all, way up, all, go all the way up to thousand or 1300. So I think that would be maybe too much of a, too much of a, almost like a shock to the system. Yeah. Most of the systems we utilize this heat reclaim on are high humidity areas. In the winter, they're going to use it for heat, which is a no brainer. And in the summertime, you're going to use it for dehumidification. Now, what I do tell the guys, like if you're out in Arizona and you're never going to use that in the summertime, you're going to condense liquid in that in that auxiliary heat exchanger over there in the coil, right? Because it's in the path of the airflow, mm -hmm. leaving the, the evaporator coil for the condensing in it. So it's mm -hmm. going to get cold. So I usually tell them to open that up a minimum of a 5 or 10% to keep something moving through there. Because you can stack liquid and oil over there, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And then that way, you at least you're not going to allow it to condense. And it's it's good for the air conditioning too, because then you're just adding just a little bit amount of heat just to keep that rolling. Yep, very good. Yep. All right. Next up, we have our flash tank slash receiver. If you look on there, it does say flash tank, but it should also say slash receiver because depending if we're subcritical, our condenser is a condenser, our receiver is a receiver, or if we're transcritical, supercritical. We got a desuperheater, flash gas condenser, and then uh, are a gas cooler versus a flash tank because of the high pressure valve, everything that's happening past that. 
we'll go over that later on in these slides. Sorry if I'm sounding a little nasal, but I've been talking all day and I had sinus surgery first of February. And one of those results is I have this now have a nasal sound to my voice. Hopefully yeah. that goes away as it heals. Yeah, mine did. Moving on. Go ahead. This, this would be our auxiliary condensing unit. So basically all we're doing is we're coming off the vessel with a supply line and returning through thermal siphon back to the vessel on our, our header, just cooling that gas down through that heat exchanger. When you're doing this, you're, you're going to have a pressure switch that's typically going to activate typically a, a liquid line solenoid on that auxiliary condenser. And usually we always want to try to make, always have it as a mechanical because if God forbid you would lose your energy management system, it should be on a battery backup or even be on the generator. But if it doesn't have a chance, at least you have that mechanical pressure switch operating that liquid line solenoid turning on that unit to, to start making that thing come on. That is exactly correct. And yes, it always, almost always is a mechanical switch. I prefer not to have it in the E2 because on those UPSs, we might only get about six hours out of those things before you lose the controls there. 100%. And we, and we use that for other reasons, but I'm sure we're going to get into that. Yep. We had a conversation about it today that say you have an issue with your maintaining your vessel pressure. You could lower that switch and help your vessel keep uh, the pressure from going too high reaching our safety set point trip where we will actually shut down our high pressure valve and helping to maintain that vessel pressure until you can uh, fix it or get parts for it. You know what I mean? I see what you're saying. And I like, I, I agree with you to a point. The only problem I would have with it, I wouldn't want people like, I'm having a little bit of problem with it. So I'm just going to turn that on, leave it on all the time. I think there should be some kind of <laughs> thing. letting. No, seriously. Oh, no, I, think I agree with you 100% and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. I think if you do have it on, you should have some sort of CT on there telling you that unit is physically on. If they see that the unit is on at the same time, all with the, with the booster rack running, if it's still running for eight hours or four hours when both of them are supposed to, it's either going to be one or the other. I, I would like to throw an alarm and say, hey, just letting you know, we probably have an underlying issue that might not be getting fixed because it's being masked by the auxiliary condenser. Exactly. And I agree with that because number one, as our pressure switches in this country, they, they never lose their settings. They always hold it. What we set it at, it'll always stay there. I'm catching your sarcasm, sir. Just letting you know that. And number two is you can't make anything in this country sailor proof. I don't care how automated it is. Somebody will figure out how to change something. And I like the word sailor proof because we can figure out how to break anything. All right, let's go on. Major components, electrical and control panel. This is our new Flex 2.0 design. A couple of key points are, as I said before, we have a independent electrical control panel and an independent control panel for the E2. Also, if you look at the feet underneath the compressors, we used to have a solid plate down there. Remember one single plate with two mounts? For harmonics, they came up with these two double plates. Really? Yep. And another thing they did is they can't, they figured out through testing that if you take your discharge line coming out of your compressor and you bend it three times, mm -hmm. 90 degree, 90 degree, 45 degree, whatever it is, you can also help eliminate those high harmonics in those discharge lines. Yeah. It's, all, it's also something to do with the length as well, right? Yes. If you'll notice, we do still have a support there to the left side of the compressor, two pieces of Unistrut welded to the base that at Huck Bolt system, and they help to help stop vibration also on that line. Because when you start reaching out there, I don't care how much you design it into it for the, to stop harmonics and pulse, compressor pulse, you're still going to get some. Do I see those Kirwan oil level controls on the side there? These are Kirwans. So you remember that, that little dongle you were going to send me, remember that, remember that conversation? I know you probably don't remember it, but oh, I'm just saying. Oh, uh, the, the set points? Uh, the dongle. I want to get a do get my hands on a oh, dongle. The, so. Oh, yeah. I'll, send me a text after this. All right. Cool, I'll cool. get that out to you, Brett. Awesome. Go ahead. Sorry. Right, so also, too, in the old days, we had a lot of issues with the pulse from the compressors from a recept is constantly pulsing like a car. They don't all go up and come down at one time. It's just mass-wise, it would just be a disaster. 
So they offset the compressors, the uh, pistons. So you get a pulse to your discharge gas. At Kramer, we used to put a plate in between the top of the compressor and the discharge valve with a holes calculated hole. That would allow the pressure to build up underneath it and go out in a smooth flow rather than a pulse. Pulse used to tear apart the solenoids in the old days. They would wear them out. But some of the manufacturers today, they build a big high chamber in the top of the heads to mm -hmm. also help with that, to try to eliminate I, that. I remember years ago that we, we had a discussion about that, like when Copeland started doing the big heads on theirs, and no one really understood why. It was one, for that reason, but two, it was causing, I guess they had a lot of complaints for people like hearing the compressors. And they found out it was creating a certain frequency that was catching cats that had uh, hearing aids. So like <laughs> no one would hear it except for these old people walking around the supermarket. I hear that. Do you hear that? It's really annoying. And it was because these people that were complaining about it, it was catching a certain frequency. So they had, I, I, from my understanding, they weld out the heads a little bit to make them a little bit taller to stop that pulsation, but as well as that, that, that frequency that they were hearing. Yep. I could agree with that. I could agree with that. I've been places where you got guys, their hearing is so sensitive. Even a blow dryer running in the bathroom bothers them. Oh, no, I can't hear shit. <laughs> I'm wearing hearing aids, Brett. Got two of them from the military. Um, when, you work, when you work on steamships, the frequency of a turbine is around three to 5,000 hertz. When you work on screws and compressors, the frequency is around three to 5,000 hertz. So needless to say, us old guys, that three to five hertz range is gone. I got you. And guess what women talk at? Three to 5,000 hertz. Oh, at least I'd like to think so. <laughs> well, I, I, I have selective hearing. 100%. She's, you know, the, ki the kids think I'm yelling at them all the time. And it's like, daddy just has a big voice. Why is he yelling? He's because he can't hear himself talk. So he just talks really loud. And, and you do that long enough. And when I put my hearing aids in, I can tell the difference. And I'll talk like this. I'll talk lower. But I've been talking so loud for so long, I just have a projecting voice. When I do these classes, people ask me if I want a mic. I said, yeah, if you want the people in the other building to hear me. I just use my normal voice and everybody can hear me in the room. But then about Wednesday, you're hoarse as hell because you've been basically yelling <laughs> half, half the week, right? That's correct. Let me ask you something. When you fly, do you get a really raspy voice that, when you get off the plane that first day? No, not so much. I, it's it's usually I get raspy about Wednesday, Thursday if I have a theory day where I'm just spouting. And it's also like how many people are asking questions in the class. Yeah. Because once you start talking about one thing, I had this one thing. I had this one thing, and I just I don't want to be like ah oh, blow you off unless we totally make a left turn and we start talking about something that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Squirrel. But squirrel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what Rusty says, squirrel. All right, so back to it. That's this is our one of our new control panels. I I like it. One of the design. I asked for twenty nine things myself and my traveling wife, who's an engineer at the factory. We go out on special designs, new designs, new customers, and anytime there's an issue. Yeah. And he said the same thing. But I lost my train of thought. But, um, of the 29 things, what I got was this. Mm -hmm. the, I don't know if you ever worked on any of our Audi racks, the first ones, all the way up to 2022, 23. I tried to work on the VFD. You couldn't get the cabinet off because it was like two inches from the top. <laughs> yeah, they dropped that. You got a big open design where you can get through the cabinet now. The doors on the back are now on all on hinges. If I could talk them into getting some sort of doorkeeper, we'll be really doing good, but I don't care what you do. You get up on the roof and a rent and there's a good wind blowing. These doors are big sales. You have to be cognizant of that and, and make sure you keep them tied down or closed. That's why I was surprised you guys haven't went with the total vertical. So at least because these 98% of these racks, unless in a motor room are up on the roof. So at least having that little bit of added protection of having a little bit of rain guard so you can actually get up and work on it, especially with the EMS if you got to mess around with it. Yes. Let alone troubleshoot the dam, the high, the high voltage side. It's something we're, we're looking at. It's mm -hmm. been mentioned. My job as the field CO2 guy 
is to take what's in the field and get it to the engineers. There was always a disconnect of what was happening in the field and what the engineers and the research guys knew what was what they were designing to. So we've made a lot of stride towards the quality of the equipment and how it operates in the last few years. Gotcha. We've listened to the, the to the technicians and we're trying to do it better. You know what I mean? They're the ones that have to deal with it, right? Yes. If it takes them longer because of some other design, you have to be aware of it, right? Yes. And and the one thing I got to say is I, I hear all the, you got armchair, armchair quarterbacks and we have armchair engineers that can, that can design a rack, a better rack and everything. The problem is when you're designing a rack for mass sales or a case for mass sales, you have to be in a budget or the customer's not going to buy it unless he's looking for a specialized piece of equipment. Agreed. So we got to build a piece of equipment that works in Texas and all the way up in the Arctic Circle, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to come up with a rack that works everywhere. <clears throat> when it gets to the, excuse me, I'm getting a little hoarse now. <clears throat> when it gets to the job site, it's the technician's job to tune it to work where he's at. And I think Kevin Compass said that. It is the technician's job to fine tune that rack to work where he's working, utilizing it, right? Mm -hmm. And I will give the, he, he was spot on with that. Unfortunately, the only thing we do deal with is a lot of times you have a lot of energy management contractors and I'm not dogging anybody. They program it a certain way. That should work. That should, all right. So that should work in Texas. That might not work up in Wisconsin or Indiana. And, yeah. and that's the thing. We have to be open to that. We can't just say, hey, that's the way we've done it forever. We need to evolve. If you're closed minded about something and not are not open to potentially talking to, hey, let's discuss this. You know what I mean? Let's talk about a solution for this instead of just saying, no, we can't do that. Yep. And one of the things we got to deal with is the customer is telling us what they want. Mm -hmm. So we had a customer come to us and tell us they want a rack that works in Texas, A, it might be oversized 10, 12%, right? Which is a good number because that gives you room for additional cases in the future. But okay. the same rack is going to go in Vancouver, Canada, where it might be oversized 38%, right? So we have to deal with an oversized rack in another area because it was actually designed to work everywhere. So, so we now, have to now, deal with the now, struggles now of, of making it work. Yeah. So instead of putting one hot gas on it, you just put two in parallel and then just have it as a stage, right? And then it's all the same. Yep. <laughs> so on, on that line, I'm going to start up next week. It's on a rack that it's going to be for Vidalia onions. And okay. it's only a medium temp rack. We have four hot gas dumps. And we also are injecting hot vapor into the vessel to load it up to keep the rack running during low load conditions. I like it. I like right. it. They also spent the money and bought the heat exchanger. So when they shut it down at the end of the picking season, they're going to run off a heat exchanger all winter. That vet rack's just going to sit there and let the heat exchanger go take care of your vessel pressure. And you're going to be good to go. You come Sweet. back around next year, you're going to turn it right back on. Sweet. Yes. That was going to be E3. I get to start that up with my buddy Brent. He's my other okay. travel wife, Brett, Brett Cheshire. <laughs> <laughs> does he know you publicly call him that oh yes he does i've introduced him that way oh jesus poor brand <laughs> but they refer to me the same way we're really we did 10 startups in 2017 together me and brent yeah. and we have been friends ever since nice both have about the same work work ethic there's a couple guys over there at emerson i really like working with Anyway, let's move on, or this is going to last forever. All right, as you can see, the difference is now all of our electrical control panel components are over here in the electrical cabinet. We don't have to worry about interference into our EMS controls, right? And this cabinet gets a little warm. Now we're over here with the with our own EMS cabinet. It's only going to heat up as much as those transformers allow it in there. Again, here's the new design. See all that room above that VFD? That looks like a lot of room. A lot of room. And then what we did, too, is this cat cabinet on the side. This is our new uh, penetrations we can allow for the electrician to come in. Because it's better than coming in on the top of the roof or up to the bottom of the rack and running them lines bare up through into the cabinet. Yeah, 100%. I've seen that. 
All right. So, of course, this is an Emerson Rackman and iPro controller. iPro Genius with the XEBD20. Are you guys getting away from the iCAD CAD, uh, valve for the HPV? Uh, so it depends on the rack design. We're still turning out the bigger racks with the ICMTS valve. Yeah. But basically on our new Flex 2.0, we've gone to a CCMT valve and a CCM bypass. I was going to say, I see both both ports of the XCV being controlled. So you have two bipolar that's, slippers on there. Okay. That's correct. Valve one's on the left, which is a high pressure valve. Valve two on the right is our gas cooler bypass. Got you. All right. So the pressure, what the iPro controller is doing, it's monitoring the pressure leaving the condenser on the liquid drop leg. It's monitoring the pressure in the flash tank. It's also utilizing the temperature of the outlet of the condenser. And we're going to go over this and I, we can argue it, we can discuss it, but where we mount the drop leg temp sensors is critical. I can tell you on our racks. And we've learned the lesson the hard way. We mount those sensors within six to eight inches of the outlet of the header. If it's a bull headed condenser with two coils, we still go on one leg or the other. Because we I found agree. where when you put it on the bull leg, or you, the further you get away from that drop leg temp sensor, if the, something happens to the water on an adiabatic, you're gonna, the temperature difference between that six inches and three feet away is drastic enough to cause operational issues and usually will trip the rack on high pressure. Oh, 100%. Yeah, because that's yeah. what's making it, it, it there's, there's going to be a delayed reaction. So if you're running transcritical, because that's basically dictating what your pressure is, you might not get that until it's too damn late. Yep. In my preference, how I like to see it <clears throat> is six inches at either side, inch and a half Rubitex with white PVC or silver metal wrap with the ends painted to stop the uh, introduction of water on the sides because heat will also affect that sensor and that sensor is only touching on one side, 25% is touching the pipe. Three quarters of that is touching the, the Rubitex. So if the Rubitex warms up, it's going to have more influence than the pipe will. Uh oh. Hold on, I think uh, I lost your red. There's only 25% of it, less than probably 25% of it, unless it's a concave uh, sensor is touching the pipe. So I want to see all that as insulated as proper. I've gone out on jobs that have been running for four or five years that have never run right. And on the one of them I went to had three BACs. One of the 326A sensor was on one drop leg. The E2 sensor was on another drop leg and they just had some Rubik, some of that gum tape on it. <laughs> well, I took a thermal image of that gum tape. The gum tape was 92 degrees. The pipe was 72 degrees. Mm. So yeah, our, our high pressure valve was getting improper information and was not controlling properly. Yeah, that's not good. All right. So where were we? All right. Then control set point. The flash tank is not, that's a misprint 38 degrees. We are controlling our vessel at 515, which is 35.2 degrees. And basically the operation of the gas cooler bypass, it's only operation is if we have excess pressure, it's to open that up and vent that to the medium tap. It's not going to build pressure. It will close and the pressure will be then regulated by what, however much gas is coming through the high pressure valve. And if basically. it does get low, we have low set points that will actually open up the high pressure valve to help repressurize the vessel. You know, there's two two safety set points if no one knew in the in the iPro and it, it probably goes the same for a lot of the other valves. If the flash tank gets too low, it opens up the HPV. If the flash tank gets too high, it shuts down the HPV because if we got seventeen hundred or I'm sorry, fifteen hundred pounds on the high side and that flash tank is just all out of whack and up to whatever your set point is, whether it be six ten or whatever, it'll slam that down. And we've we've seen that happen. A couple guys in the summertime where the adiabatic fins are not clean, like the, the outside looks good, but the actual fins are blocked up. You'll see this ongoing thing where you're like, wait a minute, it's going on and it's going open. And then all of a sudden the HPV closes. It's high pressure. Why isn't it coming on? Because they're not aware of that safety that's interfering, actually causing that to shut down. Yep, that's correct. So there's another point what you brought up. Say you go into phase loss or some sort of failure and, and the rack shuts down. And that vessel pressure builds up and gets up above that 610 
or if it's 326A, the 40 bar uh, safety limit, then that controller goes into safety mode and shuts down that high pressure valve. So when you walk up to the rack and if you don't look at your vessel, you turn the compressor, you fix your oil prob, you turn the compressor back on, all they're going to do is come on and bump right off on high pressure because it will not allow that valve to open. So if you go up to a rack and your vessel pressure is above that threshold on the high side, bend it down. Blow some of that pressure off. Get it down to about 550. I was, hoping, I was hoping you were going to say that. I was waiting for it. I'm like, he's going to say it. He's going to say it. Because I, had a, I got, had a guy actually do that. And he's what do I do? I was like, you're going to have to vent some off the flash tank. He's like, why? I was like, because it's going to keep going in this death loop where it keeps going high pressure. And then because the medium temp compressor is going to shut off on high pressure, then the vessel is going to go up. And it's just going to keep going back and forth playing this limbo. Get the flash tank under control by just basically burping off the top and bringing that pressure down because essentially the refrigerant will refrigerate itself. It'll drop down in pressure. It means it drop down in temperature, and then you'll get it back under control. Yep. Very good. All right. All right. So basically the iPros, we're looking at drop leg pressure, the receiver pressure, and the drop leg temp. And all we're worried about is what's going on right here in that upper section that's not colored in yellow. Mm -hmm. We don't care what's going on down here realistically for the control of the high pressure and the, and the gas cooler bypass. The two outputs are four wires for the HPV and four wires for the flash gas bypass. If this does have a IC MTS valve on it or ICAT as we call it, then you'll use the zero to 10 volt out and you will not use your valve one position. All right, very good. So basically the wiring here is if you look over on the left, disregard that second transducer, uh, sex, second temperature sensor down, that's for a gas cooler bypass. I don't know why they got it into this diagram because we're not using a lot of gas cooler bypasses right now in the US. So you're gonna use the top temp sensor, that's gonna be your drop leg temp sensor that goes over where we talked about, discussed within six to 12 inches of your, dis your uh, discharge out of your header. You'll have your gas cooler transducer and your medium and your receiver vessel transducer. Mm -hmm. And then your output over to your XM XEV20D for your stepper valve control out. So if you lose comps between the X, the Emerson, the XEV and the uh, iPro, there's a little LED light in there that'll start flashing red if I remember right. All I'm right. Trying, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I can't remember either. Also, when you guys are starting these up, make sure that the transformer for the for the iPro controller is not center tapped and also not grounded. If you try to ground that thing, you might send potentially 14 volts out to your to your communications line, which is going to have a bad time. So just letting you know, if you have a brand new rack, just make sure you double, triple check that because it's going to save you so much headache if you find it before you boot that thing up. Yep. So one other thing we have too, is if we trip this rack on any kind of failure, <clears throat> we'll want to close the high pressure valve and the gas cooler bypass. Because what we want to do is stop everything in stasis where it's at, kill the cases, kill the high pressure valve. We want the vessel pressure and the high pressure valve pressure to stay separated. We kill the gas cooler bypass. We don't want to increase our medium temp suction pop a relief valve. To do that, you look down the bottom of this diagram where it's says 21 and 21 and 22. You'll notice one is a board output and that's for a rack fail. Mm -hmm. And the other is the PMR relay for phase loss. And that feeds 24 volt C DC down and around and up into, man, I want to say, I thought it was 31 and 14 or seven. I can't see from this diagram, but that's our shutdown for the high pressure valve on a Danfoss. It's going to be the very top left corner, it's number one, number two, that will, when it opens, it just turns that that controller off and it actually says off. So what are your thoughts? So I've been asked this question, the same thing with battery, when you lose it for the UPS battery backup, right? You're supposed to close the HPV valve. But we were talking about this in class and I'm like, they're asking me, do you close the BGV? And I was like, I wouldn't think that you would want to because if God forbid the caseload if the fans are keep rolling or whatever, at least everything's going to check back up to upstairs. What are you, you guys don't close the BGV, correct? Yeah, we, when we shut down, when we shut down these controllers, we're shutting them hundred percent. Gas Both cooler goes down because we've lost our compressors basically. Okay. So if we don't have control of our suction, we don't want to put any gas in there. 
No, I, I know about the HPV, but I'm saying the BGV. Yeah, basically, we closed we close that down to 100 percent too. You close that too. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to get I wanted to know what you guys do. Yep, that's what we do. Okay, just so I'm not putting out crappy information. That's all. That's all I'm worried about. Oh, you're doing good, Brett. I've here and I think that you're an extremely talented technician and trainer. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. All right.